Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for thank you for coming to this uh, talk in our series of BCI related talks here at MSR. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Brandon Allison from UC San Diego. He's been working on BCIs for two decades, and um, he's going to talk about mainstream BCIs today. So, without further ado, Brandon, please. All right. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you for the intro and for coming, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, my name is Brendan Allison. I'm a visiting scholar with the Cognitive Science Department at UC San Diego. And also on a volunteer basis, I'm an officer with the Brain Computer Interface Society, which I'll talk about a bit later. However, for the first part of my disclaimer, this talk just represents my perspective. I'm not representing any other person or entity. And... I'm not being paid by anyone. MSR is kindly reimbursing my travel costs and meals, but no one's paying me. In fact, the only entities that have paid me are these two. So I'm a visiting scholar with UCSD. I'm loyal to them, but I, I don't receive any salary from them. So one thing I'd like to do to start, and this is a risky way to start because it involves audience participation, but we'll see is just to sort of establish a baseline. And especially since this is being recorded, I thought it would be fun to just run a few questions by the audience and see how you react and what people think about BCIs today. And so it's audience participation time. And the first one is I'd just like to ask you to raise your hand if the answer is yes. The first question is, can you name some BCIs? All right, so for those of you at home, most people are, are responding yes. And then do you agree with this statement? Modern BCIs can be useful for patients with ALS or other serious neurological conditions. Please raise your hand. So yeah, most people are raising their hand. And then raise your hand if you agree with this. Modern BCIs can be useful to healthy people in everyday life. Yeah, so nobody, now we have zero. And then the last one. Can you raise your hand if you used a BCI in the last month? All right, so we got three, I think, sort of three. All right, so this is speaker out on a limb. I obviously have not had time to edit this slide. I do not have such a fast BCI. Uh, so my guess is the audience would say, yes, I can name some BCIs. Yes, modern BCIs could be useful for some patients, but I was also guessing most people would say, no, I don't think modern BCIs are useful to most mainstream people in everyday life. And I thought most people would say, no, I, I haven't used a BCI in the last month. To provide a little additional detail, I've asked the same or similar questions at recent brain-computer interface conferences and at a talk at Google and other places where you might think these would be early adopters of BCIs. If there were people who really knew about computing, interfaces, working with software, these would be the ones. And yet, even here at, at Microsoft, like these other entities, this is a nice baseline. Right now, as of February 2020, even people who are, are knowledgeable, who are sort of insiders in the field, or at least would be well connected to them, aren't using BCIs and, and don't see them as being useful, except for patients. And this has been the case for quite a while. Most people have believed this, and I generally agree with it. So that's another thing to help set the tone for this talk. My, my goal in this talk is not at all to promote mainstream BCIs as something imminent. In fact, I'll publicly say now, I, I don't think they're imminent. I, I don't think these answers are likely to change for most people in the near future. But when will they change, right? So. Let's say I were to give this talk here in 2030. What do you think people would respond? 2040, I, I hope I'm still speaking by then, and so on. When, you know, and I, I would guess if I said something way out there, if I said in the year 3000, do you think modern BCIs as of that time might be useful? Yeah, I think most people here, especially given it's Microsoft, recognize that keyboards and mice and other interfaces are more temporary and transitory than they seem. Right now we're used to them, that's the main way to interact with systems, but may not be that way forever. And uh, a, an old friend of mine worked for Microsoft and he would say he'd be giving a talk and some people in the audience would be critical and 
make trouble for him. And so he would say, look, I understand that the reason you're doing this is not because of anything related to my talk, but just because I'm with Microsoft and you want to complain. And so that's part of the job. That's fine. And so similarly, I, I, I'm not at all the avatar of BCIs for everyone. I'm very interested in it, and I always have been. But uh, just as with my talk before, I'm very much aware there are practical issues. And one of the main ones is, of course, why not use something else, some other way to communicate? And that's uh, on a later slide. So this raises the question of why. why. Why would I use a BCI unless I basically have no other choice? And this is the classical view. So for a few slides, I'm going to review what seems to be the classical established view that I get not only from papers, but talking with people in conferences. And this is the classical view, which was consistent with the little survey I did. That is, most people here say, yes, BCI is for users with disabilities. Intentionally, these are all older images. This is from 1999. This is around 2000 from Graz. This is at least 10 years old, but these are examples of publications that are well established showing patients with disabilities and for ethical reasons I should say of course these people have had their allowed their pictures to be shown. And therefore the classical view is that widespread BCI adoption re requires replacing conventional interfaces for conventional users in conventional settings. That is a lot of people might look at that last slide and say okay there's a certain setting where BCIs are useful. It's a patient that you've got no other choice. But to make BCIs useful for other people, you would need something where people are doing a common mainstream thing, like, for example, playing a computer game, and the BCI has to replace other interfaces. And I think that's a mistake. In other words, part of what I'm getting at in my talk is that Although I still don't think mainstream BCIs are imminent, I see very consistent mistakes being made in papers, in talks, in talking with conferences, and in other people, business people or, or students or whoever, who are trying to think of a mainstream BCI. And they're like, well, you've got to come up with this or it's never going to happen. Instead, the emerging view is first you can replace or supplement a conventional interface. This is a critical point. In fact, I'll go further. The first mainstream BCI will be something used in combination with another interface or another task. So the idea that you would have a BCI, so a key point of this is notice this person has hands on the table even though there's another way to communicate. And, and this is not how it's going to happen. You're not going to see someone saying, wow, I need no other way to do anything. The BCI is everything. It will be a BCI combined with other interfaces or ways to interact. This is what's called a hybrid BCI. And also for specific settings. And so here again you have an example of a user at home, free to use keyboards, no problem. And what if there are certain settings or certain environments in which the cost of using a keyboard or another interface is, is higher than it normally is? And this is also something that's come up before and was in my 2006 talk where People have looked at cases such as drivers where the driver's hands are busy. You, you can't really use a keyboard or mouse or texting on your cell phone or something quite as easily. Mechanics or airline mechanics came up. Your head is inside a jet engine. You can't speak. It's too loud. Various military applications have come up that I haven't worked on. Soldiers, you, you want to be silent and you don't want to move. How do you send information? And again, I'm not saying this is imminent. To my knowledge, soldiers aren't using this either. And another issue with, with disability is this term that I've learned from the HCI literature of situational disability. That is, in certain situations, a healthy person may be somewhat like a disabled user. Again, if you're driving or for some reason your hands are busy, in a sense, you're like a person who doesn't have hands available. An assistive technology designed for someone who doesn't have the ability to use hands might seem more practical for you in that specific setting. And an example I like to give with, with this is, is laziness. And so once I, I gave a, a talk at Philips headquarters in Eindhoven, we were working with them on a grant, and they 
you know, they are, of course, very well known as, as electronics manufacturers. And so I asked, do you make any televisions anymore without remote controls? And they said, no, of course not. You know, why would we? The remote control is a great example of sort of disability by laziness, and I'm, I use them too, but you're watching TV. You could get up. You could get up and change the channel. You could push a button. You could turn that old dial. There are lots of ways that you could do it. You do not have a medical need for that remote control. Yet, I'm not going to ask, but if I were to say show of hands, I'd say, yeah, most people have used them. Have any of you actually gone up to your TV and played with it? Probably not. But again, I won't, I won't ask that publicly. And if you think about that, that's actually a tremendous imposition on your TV viewing experience. So you're watching TV, you wish to change the channel. You have to disengage a little bit from the TV. You have to dig around in the couch to find the remote control. You have to look at it. You have to orient it the right way. You have to push a button. All of this is disrupting what you're doing otherwise. Is there an easier way to do that right now with the BCI? No, but this is just an example of an environment in which people would not normally think of a TV viewer of someone who is disabled or might need an assistive technology, but that remote control example is, is getting in that direction. Right? Again, not quite the same. And another conventional view that I want to get at is that widespread BCI adoption requires dramatically new capabilities. In other words, we need a BCI that can do something way beyond what any existing system can do because right now they can't really do anything useful. And this is necessary to get around the problem that wired and ugly systems are unappealing. In other words, nobody's going to use a system with a cap and gel and all that. Well, of course, that's all changing. So in particular, practical electrodes, by which I mean either dry electrodes or various uh, electrodes that rely on water instead of gel, or uh, this company, Advanced Brain Monitoring, they have a, an electrode that releases gel as needed over time. All of these things make BCIs much more practical, especially for people who don't want to put gel in their hair, which is basically everyone except me. And I think it's tremendous fun. Uh, so you have these dry ones, and then wirelessness is a big deal. Of course, if you've got to get, get up and walk around and there are cables, that's not going to work. And so concordantly, you have a, a change in cosmesis, that is cosmetic appeal. And I'm arguing this is, of course, a factor for mainstream BCI adoption that many people either don't think about or, or like I said, they think it's secondary to capability. In other words, first you've got to make the ultimate BCI, and then nobody cares about this, and that's just not, not correct. So these are a few examples of different efforts to make BCIs that would be more cosmetically appealing to users. And in the next few slides, I'm not just getting at objective cosmesis, because there's no such thing. It's a judgment call if the BCI looks appealing to you, but also perceived cosmesis. What do people think about it? Uh, so here, one way you can do this is you can hire a model. It sounds trivial, but if you look a lot of pictures of BCIs, uh, they, they have some grad student in engineering who's shaggy and doesn't have uh, any makeup on. Another interesting case is over here. This was a specially made device called the Unicorn, and this woman is a, a fashion designer. And she was trying to get at the problem of persons with high-functioning autism. So many children with autism are not comfortable with EEG caps. You put on a cap that looks like this, and they don't like the feeling of it pressing all around their head. And so she designed this for children with autism. It's called the unicorn. And you can see it. Most of the head is exposed. It's not like you're covered up right there. And it has this little unicorn thing on it, which is not functional, but... Uh, apparently, this was much more popular with such people. If you want to do research with this population, you need a hat that they will, will wear. Regarding the perception of whether something is cosmetically cool, these are all examples in the last few years or so, this is a bit older, of movies or other things in which you have electrode caps that aren't presented as sort of weird future things, but sort of mainstream. So. There's the talk show host, Colbert, and there's President Obama talking to a guy wearing an electrode cap. 
Uh, this is from X-Men. You guys recognize this famous author, science fiction hero. Uh, this is Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian. And when, we, uh, when he was nominated for an Oscar, we made him these little 3D printed Oscar statuettes and, put a, put, and he nicely got that picture. The point is that this cap looks the same as other caps. This cap here that he was wearing, is, it appears to be the same type of cap that I remember using in the 90s. But the fact that you put it on someone who's popular and is not a nerd and whatnot affects perceived cosmesis. He's a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> right. He's a nerd. Right. Yeah. He, he knows Lord of the Rings better than I, all nerds. Speaking of nerds, and I say this in a, in a nice way, one of my friends in the field is Curve Schalk. And another issue in the common view that I mean to challenge is that speed is the critical factor for broader adoption. So you get this a lot in various papers like this one. And the idea is, well, BCIs are very slow. They have to get faster. And I just sort of adopted this part here. In other words, this, this text is mine and not from the image, where I was looking at this in terms of the hype cycle. In other words, right now, you know, BCIs might be sort of severely disabled, and you might see them with people with less severe disabilities. For example, there are cases now where people who are able to use another interface choose a BCI. For example, there are cases of patients choosing a BCI over an eye tracker because the eye tracker is fatiguing. If you have very limited muscle control, then doing this, looking around left and right, it is exhausting. And so I was saying, then you get eager users and finally to mainstream healthy users. This is just an adaptation of the, the classic hype cycle. But in response to that 2008 paper, I, I developed this framework here where I'm trying to get far beyond speed in terms of looking at what matters in terms of a, any user, including a mainstream user, in terms of BCI adoption. And you see speed is really only a part of it. That's only one thing. One example that keeps coming up from people who work with patients is that patients will often not choose to maximize information throughput, but instead to maximize accuracy, right? This is very well established. So you probably know that you, there's, you, you can alter your system so that accuracy goes down and speed goes up or vice versa, and you can work out the, the way to maximize bit rate or information transfer rate. And yet, many patients say, even though it will slow the system down, I'm very frustrated by errors. And so that already starts to, to challenge the, the importance of speed. You know, so accuracy is also there. Another big one is the size of your alphabet, which is a tremendously ignored issue. So if you can choose one out of 10 items versus one out of hundreds, that's a really big deal. And I'm happy to talk about this indefinitely, but. One issue that I mentioned already that I want to get at, I made up this term called distraction quotient. And what I define that as is a representation of how much using the BCI distracts you from whatever else you're doing. Now, it might be that your only goal is to use the BCI. You, you just want to use the BCI because you're playing a BCI-based game or something. You have no interest in anything else. But generally, using the BCI is quite distracting. If, if you haven't used one, a lot of them, you have to count flashes, you have to pay attention to something, you have to imagine movement. This makes it much harder for you to type or speak or do other things. And there's a type uh, of BCI that's called passive BCI, in which, at least theoretically, if it works, the distraction quotient is zero, meaning it doesn't require anything for you to get information from the BCI. You don't have to count flashes. You can do whatever else you were doing. And it might give you information such as uh, alertness or do you think you made an error? I'll get into examples of this. And I think this is also still very much ignored. People think about the BCI, but not the BCI as part of a, an integrated interactive platform in which the goal of the user is to send information through whatever means are most effective at that point in that situation. Might be brain activity, might be eye activity, keyboard, or whatever. Like the, the one I mentioned, the, this was a paper by Robert Lieb in which he 
provided a BCI, I think it was 2006, but I'm not sure. He provided a BCI and an eye tracker to people, and many of the patients said, we, we prefer to use the BCI, it's, it's just easier. And another interesting issue is that the types of BCIs haven't really changed much. So in 2006, my talk was mainly focused on BCIs themselves, the different types of BCIs rather than mainstream applications. And I said these were the main types of BCIs. Looking at it today hasn't really changed. So slow cortical potential BCIs are no longer that prevalent, but otherwise the, these are the same. And this is another fundamental challenge that has yet to be overcome. Is there something else you can do mentally? Is there something else you can think, something else you can pick up with the EEG or other methods that is useful? And although this hasn't developed a lot, I'm not at all saying there's no hope for it in the future. Uh, as I was discussing, improved machine learning is creating all kinds of options. And concordantly, you have an ongoing increase in EEG research. What, what can people do that might influence the EEG, and how does it influence the EEG? And I'll talk more about this a bit later. That's a link to my talk from before, but it's mainly for people at home because I think you guys can find it at Microsoft. And so I would also say, yeah, ease is a critical thing. Ease and utility, that is, what is the BCI doing for you? This is also a, a big thing. You, okay, great, you find out that someone just made a mistake or is looking over there and thinking about something. Who cares? And so these are a few examples of trying to integrate them with devices like cell phones or hats or whatever, which so far have met with pretty limited success, but I, I don't think that will be forever. So inevitably, when you're thinking about this question of BCIs, th this is one of the first things to ask, and this happens all the time. I I'll talk to someone, and the person will have a, a great idea for a BCI, and I'd say, that's great, but why not use an eye tracker? And they say, you've destroyed my idea. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so one, it could potentially be faster than an unavailable interface. So is a BCI faster than a keyboard? No, but if you have no keyboard, if it's not practical, then it might be faster. Now, for a BCI to be more practical, you've got to have something on your head. There are various environments where people already tend to have things on their heads. We've talked about that. Unfortunately, my experience is that people who do that don't want anything more on their head, notably pilots. So uh, my grandfather was a pilot. He, he flew Marine One, um, Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. So he was a senior officer and he basically said that pilots will not want something on their head reading their brain waves no matter what. And I said, don't you have the authority to order other people, Lieutenant Colonel? And he said, mm, I'm retired. Anyway, if it's impractical, can easily be used or would take longer to provide the same information. So we, we chatted about this over lunch with usability testing and another example is neuromarketing. You could have someone view an advertisement or use an interface, and then afterward you can say, hey, what did you think of that? Were there any things in the ad that got your attention? When you were using that interface, was there any period where you were a little confused and disoriented? Well, you could get that information, or at least some of it, but you, you now have an objective way. You can have someone using something, you can say, without interfering in any way, well, when well, that person used this particular software or this particular environment, we saw an increase in these uh, sorts of problems, such as feeling disengaged, dozing off, stuff like that. And you're probably aware neuromarketing has got a lot of attention. There is a, a company called Neurofocus that was sold to Nielsen Marketing, and I don't know what's happened with them since then, but that was their focus. And I know that two of the people involved, Bob Knight and John Polich, are top electrophysiologists. Uh, John Polich was my boss. He knows P300s literally, I think, better than anyone in the world. And that's another example. You want to know in real time what someone thinks. You can stop them. I've been in focus groups, and they'll stop you in the middle of an ad and say, what do you think of this and this and that? And that's disrupting the whole process. It's wasting time. You have the 600-pound gorilla problem. There's one guy in the room who says, oh, that's wonderful, and nobody else wants to talk. 
none of these problems exist, at least theoretically, if you're getting information passively some way through BCI, eye tracking, or other means. Um, another big answer to why not use something else is that at least in some cases it might be easier to use than other interfaces. And again, I'm not saying this is the case right now, but this is what things are developing toward. It might be more practical in a real world setting. TV remote control. Another one is it could potentially be more intuitive. And this is something that really is changing in the field and is a, a dramatic development is the prospect of of auditory reconstruction, which has been getting a lot of attention, primarily with invasive BCI, but the idea that from electrodes you can determine what someone is thinking about saying, what words someone is thinking, or even which sounds or music someone is thinking about. If that develops, especially if it develops non-invasively, then you have something BCIs have never been able to do before, which is a direct literal BCI. Instead of spelling by counting this flash or thinking about this and then thinking about this, you just think of the word. This keyboard, which everyone is used to, is also a highly unnatural, unintuitive interface. It's just that we're used to it. If I want to convey Apple, what does me pushing these buttons have to do in any way with Apple-ness or any, anything related to fruit? I, it's, it's an arbitrary mapping that happens to be the best way to send information to a computer that we have, that most people think, but it's certainly not the best ultimate interface. And privacy, I talked about this a little bit, that you might be able to determine if someone wants to pay attention to a certain region or whatever, that's private. In other words, most other ways of sending information, someone can watch you, they can listen to you talk, they can record it. This way, at least in theory, the process of you sending information, nobody knows exactly what you're sending. And one example of why this might be useful is some security settings, and then on the other scale of sort of fun is, is gaming. You're playing a game, you don't want the other person to know what you're doing. Again, I think this is somewhat further in the future, but it's it's there. And this one is not in the future. So this, this has been the answer most of the time. So just as I've said, well, you talk about BCIs, and you can always get people to say, oh, well, they're useful for patients. You can also always get this out of people. You say, well, what if people want to use BCI despite everything else? Yes, it's inefficient. I don't like it. I don't want this stuff on my head. I just want to use it for fun. You, nobody has any answer to that except, well, there aren't that many people who do so. But th that's out there. I mean, there is something cool about putting a thing on your head and communicating, even though I'm obviously kind of biased. So now I'll talk about some applications for the public. And intentionally, a lot of these slides differ in time. That is, some of these are things that have been pursued for decades, like alertness monitoring, and then others are relatively new. So this is one that's been around for a while from Paul Scheide and his colleagues of image triaging. And what they could do is if they presented images to people very quickly, they could tell from the EEG which images stood out. For example, you can show them pictures of trucks and one of them is longer, you would have a slightly different reaction to the longer truck. And so although I don't no image triaging, the idea was to reduce the time. So instead of someone looking at images all day and you say, oh, that one's important, uh, that one's important, if you can present something 10 times a second, which is, of course, much faster than you can type, that would be one example, not so much of a mainstream user, but at least of a healthy user where this is useful. As far as other possible applications for mainstream users, I don't know. Uh, yeah, by the way, if you're Coming, expecting me to tell you the killer app for BCIs, I mean, you should have known better. <laughs> so yes, I'm not presenting the killer app, I'm just talking about the process. When someone does come up with the killer app for BCIs, I'm going to be really, really mad that I didn't think of it. But here we are. And I, I thought, and again, I don't know immediately, but studying. So you have a list of 100 words that you want to remember. If you had an EEG system on that's locked to each of these, you could probably determine from the P300 and other things which images you are likely to later remember. This is research from Manny Donchin dating back a long time. 
you need to remember 100 words. Right now, you read the words, you test yourself, you go back and iteratively. Now you get rid of the testing yourself. Words just keep coming up. You never have to test yourself. As words come up, you start noticing, boy, uh, some of those initial words are gone. What's happening that you don't know about is it's doing something similar to this. That is, words that you are likely to later remember, you just don't see again. Again, this assumes the system is accurate. And a few words that you're not likely to remember, it just presents them again or, or other information. And another very well, much better established extension of, of, of BCI is, is neurofeedback, which has also been around a long time. And done properly, neurofeedback can be helpful for some people, but part of the problem is that this has become heavily saturated. So many people and so many companies for decades now have been talking about it. This is, these are just a few examples. I haven't used any of these, so I don't mean to say that they're good or bad. These are just examples. And if you're a, an end user, how do you know? You're, you're not an EEG expert. You see some ads. And there are a lot of examples of sort of unethical neurofeedback. I have a little of that later. <coughs> this is one that most people don't know about, but it turns out the P300 and other signals can be used for detecting lies, or when I say a lie, it's in quotes. What it's really detecting is whether you perceive an image as familiar or unfamiliar. And so Larry Farwell and his team have a company called Brainwave Science where they've tried to use this for forensic purposes, for determining whether people actually are guilty or innocent. And a lot of people don't realize uh, this was approved in a court in, I of, in Iowa over 10 years ago. So. There was a court, and they had a trial that addressed the question of whether brainwave fingerprinting should be admissible in court. The court ruled yes. And so uh, unless something has changed, if you get arrested in Iowa, you can use brainwave fingerprinting as part of your defense. Um, I would <laughs> recommend not getting arrested in any state. but you know, Neuromarketing. So I've mentioned this, how to focus groups react to sounds or images. So first, it's not literal. It's not like part of your brain lights up and says Coca-Cola. And this is an example that I, I used. So this is Harley Davidson cologne. And I would not ask you to raise your hand if you're wearing Harley Davidson cologne, because I'm pretty sure you're not, and they don't make it anymore. But I was talking about this with some ad person, and this was apparently a famous example of a focus group failure. Harley Davidson made cologne. And they got focus groups, and they said, here, you know, try it. And it was a classic 600-pound gorilla problem. You've got a few big guys in the room who are bikers, and they say, yeah, Harley-Davidson cologne. And it turned out, in fact, many people in the focus group were not that positive about it, but didn't want to say anything. Like, okay, whatever. And so, in theory, I'm pretty sure they didn't do neuromarketing, this might be an example where you would have got a, a different result. Instead of people being afraid to share their opinions, they just, their opinions come out as they see Harley-Davidson cologne. Not just EEG alone, I mean, maybe their mouth turns down or eye, eye activity, but uh, that might have prevented Harley-Davidson from making cologne, which I assume is bad, I don't know. So yeah. That's exactly another, uh, another confirmation. Technically, face expression processing and getting emotions uh, or anything else from the face is way more advanced and that's one of the texts which instantly can be used today mm -hmm. instead of BCI which is still down the road. Right. Yeah, I would say neuromarketing, I, I would think it would be most effective using a headset that's sent, picking up a lot more than EEG. If I were involved, the first thing I would say is hybrid BCI. I, I would like to go ahead and put an electrode cap on them if you want, but one of the first things I'm going to look at is eye activity, which you can get from the EEG, facial muscle contraction. So yeah, I would be the, I think this is a good example of a case where EEG might be useful as a supplement to other things, but I'm not saying you would just put a cap on them and get nothing else. Um, but yeah, you don't have any delays, you don't have to wait, there's no distraction, you don't have to stop them. You don't have follow-up questionnaires. You don't have pleasing the experimenter. So another example is someone made peach Christmas lights. 
and nobody wanted to say, you're such a nice guy, but this is terrible. <laughs> you know? Not noticing, forgetting the 600-pound gorilla. Wow, that guy likes Harley perfume, so I'm not going to argue. Would you argue with that gorilla? And I talked a little at, at lunch over error detection. So there's this signal called the error-related negativity. And this is an example of a study from a while ago, 20 years ago. And with four persons, it was showing that three of the people had some overall improvement in their information transfer rate with a BCI using this. And so I'd be quite interested in studies where they're looking at error detection while someone is not using a BCI but using other things. I'll get to this soon with an example from Scott McCaig and Professor Jung and colleagues. And, you know, the main problem with this is it's difficult to get on a single trial basis. And so I've thought a lot, and I've talked with a guy here named Desney Tan and a professor named Anton Nyholt and others about if you're not so concerned with the real-time constraint, then this is much more viable. And so I mentioned the example of usability assessment, not just for software, but other types of settings. And then this is something I actually talked with Eric Korvitz, who's, who's still here <laughs> on my way to my last talk, with this example of using Microsoft Word. So you're using Microsoft Word, which, why, I'm at Microsoft. And you're typing, and the computer recognizes that you've typed a word that the computer doesn't recognize. What happens? That word becomes underlined in red, and now the user has to stop typing and do one of two things, either disengage from typing and probably use the mouse to right-click on that and correct the error. In other words, you're telling the system that you believe an error was made. You're telling the system, you're right, I did make a mistake. Option two is the opposite. The system is wrong. You didn't make a mistake. You want it to not underline that or add it to dictionary automatically or in some other way not distract you from typing. I'm in the middle of an important sentence. I got something to say. And so this is something I was talking about with him, is it's not just detection or error, but also the absence of error. In other words, if you can tell someone thought no error was made, that might be useful. And I'm also saying this is a, a largely underappreciated direction, again, of not, not just using it as an error correction system for BCIs, but for other types of interactions. And this is what I was just talking about with Scott McCaig and Si Peng Jung and colleagues. And this was a study based on only two EEG channels in the late 90s, actually a little over 20 years ago. And red shows targets that were missed by professional sonar operators. So these were people who were naval personnel who had a position as sonar operators. So they, they worked on submarines, they had experience. And these, this red thing here is showing sort of lapses in, in their attention that the system predicted. And then green is the, um, their, their hit rate. And so you see here with red and blue, what this is showing is that blue is the actual error rate and red is the predicted error rate. So there are two parts of this. One of them is, was not so new, which is if people are in a state where they're more likely to make errors, we can pick that up from the EEG with only two, two channels, which is pretty good. But the second part, which I thought was much more interesting, is they could predict these alertness lapses by a few seconds with the EEG. That is, they could, there was a certain time period when there was no other way to know that the person was more likely to make errors except the EEG, or at least no way that we know of. If you could have found something then, that could be real useful. You uh, call in a replacement supervisor, or you play the voice of the crew chief yelling at the guy, or whatever they do on a sonar. Actually, ask the sonar people. They say, yeah, the chief will yell at you. And in the case of alertness monitoring here, it's even more than a, a car. I mean, a, a submarine hits a mine. That's very bad. Yes? Just a question from mm -hmm. online. Uh, which two EEG channels, if you remember? OZ. One of them was OZ, and one of them was FCZ. So they're both midline channels. And these two people, so Scott McCaig is still at UCSD, along with his colleague, uh, Xi Peng Zheng. And, you know, so this, this is going beyond real-time alertness monitoring. This is almost proactive alertness monitoring. So I'm a little confused. You, you said that, that 
I mean, it looks to me like the blue is leading the red. The blue uh, is the actual. So the blue is the actual error rate, and the red seems to be lagging a little bit. So, I mean, I, but I thought what you just said is that... No, they predicted it ahead of time, so I, I'll check. I might have reversed that, but I remember the key point is that they were able to predict periods of increased error likelihood okay. ahead of time. All right, so then the question is, great. You're aware that the user might be more likely to make mistakes, or for some reason you're getting something from the EG. Well, so what? What do you do with it? And this is an example from a, a group in NASA. There's a, a guy named Alan Pope who uh, retired a while ago. But he had some work on adaptation based on EEG measures of task engagement. So the idea was that if a, a pilot or astronaut or another person w was overloaded, in other words, the EEG indicated this person was already getting too much information, you would reduce the incoming information switch it to an automated system, get a backup person, whatever. And also vice versa, if the person was bored, maybe this is a time to call in increased engagement. And another example is uh, this Ewing et al. paper where he was getting at the same idea for game adaptation. So if someone is playing a game, just like doing a neurofeedback task or a lot of tasks, there's a risk of the person could be getting really bored or could be getting overloaded, just like the pilot example. And this paper was getting at how you could modify the game difficulty level and the incoming information accordingly. And this is also the sort of thing that I mentioned Desney Tan here, along with uh, Anton Nyholt and colleagues, have been interested in for a while, uh, this, this adaptive interface where ideally, from the user's perspective, without any extra work, you don't have to say I'm overloaded or something, you just wear this thing on your head. From the user's perspective, the game's always really engaging. You're, you're doing really well, you're not perfect, you have to work a little bit harder or else you get bored, you're certainly not overloaded. That could be very appealing, not just for games for fun, but training and, and other applications. So he, he was presenting the idea of this bio-cybernetic loop where the EEG would affect the difficulty of a Tetris game, but you get the general idea. I have several slides that'll be quick on gaming and fun. So there's not a lot of text, these are just examples. And these are all systems that may not necessarily be BCI. So they claim that they're working on EEG. I have some things to say about that, but not right now. And this is, uh, for example, called the MindFlex. So this was a game, and you're supposed to use the BCI to manipulate this ball in the game. This is another one. This is called the Star Wars Force Trainer. You can get it on Amazon for about 50 bucks right now. And the Star Wars Force Trainer, what you do is you use the force to move this ball up and down, to control the height of a ball. How it works is many people have seen the trick where you, if you have a ball and a fan under it, the ball appears to be suspended. And so what you're actually doing is you're using the EEG to control the strength of that fan. So with the EEG, you can make the ball go up and down. Is that the same as using the force? I don't know. <laughs> this, this may be it. So it was, it, was, it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I mean, who knows what they used? <laughs> and... This is a company called Emotive. Uh, you may have heard of them where they, they have this game. And notice also they're working, this headset doesn't look like a, 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 a classical cap. They're trying to make it look cool and they got red, red on there. This was one that I worked on. So a few people have done brain computer interface World of Warcraft. And this one was an example that used SSVEP. We also had a different one with motor activity. But basically, you can move around the environment with these four controls, left, right, forward, and select. You can do a fair amount, largely because of the good World of Warcraft interface. A key reason is that this select icon changes to different things depending on where you are. We didn't do this. This was Blizzard Entertainment. But it, it was a nice example. We were thinking, well, how could you use only four commands to convey more than four potential instructions in a context-dependent fashion. We're like, well, these guys already did it. And the movement commands, I mean, you can go anywhere in 2D space with just those three. And so we've, 
we gave this demonstration at UC San Diego, and I told the story that I was unable to do it because UCSD blocked all the ports for World of Warcraft. So we had a network guy, and we were trying to, everything was working from a BCI standpoint, and yet we couldn't actually get online. And so the network guy had about 45 minutes. You know, I said, could you please talk to a supervisor or something? and came back and said I couldn't. Like, I did talk to a supervisor, I did. I was saying there was a professor giving a talk, they just couldn't get to that point. In other words, they're so uh, committed to that. They had so many problems with students doing that. I also gave this talk at Blizzard headquarters in Irvine, California. Unsurprisingly, we had no trouble getting onto their WoW server. It was really fast. The funny story there is many of the people in the room were on the production team, so they're constantly yelling at me, you know, go left or shoot that orc. <laughs> like, I'm not demonstrating mastery of the game, I'm just showing this BCI thing. And I said I had some slides about fun. This is a great one, the Nekomimi cat ears. I love this. So this person is wearing these cat ears, and what the cat ears are supposed to do, you can just see that headband up at the top there, is they perk up if the user is interested or engaged, and they droop if the user is not interested. And so I thought, okay, that's a great example of sort of a, a cute thing. It's not really meant as a practical one, but people might buy it for fun. Later on, I thought this would be immensely useful for public speaking. So what if every time you have someone here, everyone in the audience has to wear one of these, right? And so if all the ears start drooping, well, it's time to move on, tell a joke. If all the ears go up, you're doing something right. I've often wanted to do a study, and you guys could do it right here. Like, a, uh, you, you kindly bought me a coffee before this, and I was wondering, you could plot that. So what is the average time per talk plotted against how much coffee did you get them just before then? You know, and so that would be another one. If, if people are bored, give them coffee. This is sort of the opposite one, where it's a competitive relaxing game. This is called Brain Ball. And by the way, I'm not with these companies, I'm just... Uh, so this was a group in Sweden, and they made a competitive relaxing game. So the ball moves toward the more relaxed person, and so whoever looks the most relaxed will win. So this is kind of a funny image, because you can't tell if they're relaxed or dead. But I'm just bringing this up, because all these slides are things that are, for the most part, fairly well established. People have done them in some cases made money from them, and yet they're not mainstream. I gave the example of the force trainer. Now, if you have an electrode right there over the forehead, is that a pure EEG system? I don't need to answer. This is a new one. This is a novel example of BCI for fun. This is not high on my list of likely mainstream applications, but I would recommend doing it here in Microsoft, because if you had a remote control cockroach, please do. And if you do, put a little camera on them. I want to be like, I want to see Bill Gates' reaction when the remote control cockroach goes in. This is, this is true. So I, I edited uh, a book chapter. We, we have a contest uh, for the best BCI research, for the annual BCI Research Award. And this is one of the submissions, and I was happy that it was nominated for award because I got to edit the book chapter. And in a way, they kind of had a BCI system for the people and a computer to brain interface, a CBI, I guess, for the cockroaches. So first, they sell this kit, and this is online. You can go to Backyard Brains right now and buy it. You can buy this kit, and the first thing they do, which is nice, is they make you anesthetize the cockroach. <laughs> like, okay, that's, you put it in ice, because frankly, after reading this, I felt bad for the cockroach. And then you can essentially put this on, which will direct it to move in a certain direction. The part that they also had is they then had humans using a brain-computer interface to send commands to two cockroaches running a race. So you're sitting here, and your buddy's right next to you, and your job is to use a BCI to direct a cockroach. You would probably prefer to do something else, but direct a cockroach to, to move through that. And so it's it's new. I've never heard of that before. And so it's more brain-to-brain -brain interface. Right. It's, if anything, it's closer to the work from uh, Rao and, and colleagues here and others with the brain-to-brain -brain interface. But to be more specific, the human is a brain-to-computer interface, and then the cockroach is a computer-to-brain interface. It would be intriguing to have the reverse. Can cockroaches control people? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. So 
I thought this was a good example of fun. It's technically impressive. And in the end, in the acknowledgments when I was editing it, I, they'd thank their subjects. And I made them specifically say, we want to thank our subjects, comma, both human and cockroach. Because honestly, after this, I thought, oh, poor cockroach. They're ugly, but yeah. Just a little sidebar that, that folks at Microsoft might be interested in is that um, a guy named uh, Stevie Batiche, who's one of the guys who works, who's sort of a senior um, guy with a bunch of our hardware groups. His, um, when he was a master's thing, he had a, a basically a, this exact thing with moths. He was controlling moths with uh, little implants. I didn't know, but... <laughs> just, just a little sidebar for all you guys who know Stevie. Uh... Yeah, it, it would work. Well, in a, a precursor to this, there was a paper that was published in Nature, uh, Talwar et al. 2002, which was interesting. So what they did is they had computer-to-brain interfaces. I think it was for rats or mice. It was, it was a rodent. They implanted electrodes in three areas. One was the medial forebrain bundle, which humans have also. That's a big area that involves reward and, and addiction and other things. And then the left and right whisker barrel cortex. So rats have an area of the cortex that responds to touch here or here. Humans have this also, but in rats it's exaggerated. It's called barrel cortex because they're really sensitive to these little whisker, whisker barrels sticking out. So they implanted these and they demonstrated that they could make mice move through a maze or an obstacle course. Basically you could, if you, you, they train the rat so that if they stimulate the left side and then the rat chooses to move, you give it a rewarding stimulus. So pretty soon, as soon as you do that, the rat moves to the left. If you do them both at the same time, the rat moves forward. The part of it that was particularly ominous toward the end is they did the following. They had the rat move up a ramp and move to the edge of a precipice. Unbeknownst to the rat, there was a clear plastic panel under there, but the rat didn't know that. In other words, the rat believed that going forward could be fatal. They gave it the little zap, and the rat didn't move forward. They increased the current, and the rat jumped off. So the rat believed it was jumping to its death, and I see no reason this wouldn't work in humans. Not that I promote that. Uh, another th issue that's come up is the idea of some kind of head-mounted display application. And when I say it's come up, uh, we gave a talk at Google, we were talking about this, and a lot of other people had said, what about something involving an HMD, which makes a lot of sense. If you're already wearing glasses on your head or headphones, well, it's much easier to put on electrodes. And people were working on earbud electrodes. These guys nom were nominated for an award a few years ago. And so... You know, with Google Glass, you might, for example, use it to select among different options. So this is getting back to the question of why would you use this if there's another way to communicate. At that time, there was this term called glass hole, which, you know, for people who were using Google Glass but were being visibly distracting, they would do this or they would say, OK, Google, all the time. And so this is a case where, yes, they could communicate with the interface another way, but it, they might choose to use the BCI for privacy and, and courtesy. You know, or maybe you could choose different parts of an image. To my knowledge, this wasn't implemented, but I know some students with Professor Kruzienski's lab were interested in it, and a lot of other people have talked about it, and that might happen. Or virtual navigation. I guess I've had two Google slides, and they didn't pay me anything. Um, Driver alertness, I've talked about that a lot, where the, the question here is why not use something else? Can you detect alertness with the EEG? Yes. Is that better than eye tracking or other ones? People have different answers to that, but it's challenging to give it a solid yes right now. But to be fair, there are people who've said no. You can get more depth and detail from the EEG than you can from an, an eye camera, and then other people don't agree, so I'm, that's getting a bit beyond my thing. And I'll talk about some emerging examples of, of big BCI, mainstream BCI. And this is also a pretty new thing in the field. So prior to 2017, there weren't any big examples of this, of a very large company or an individual like Elon Musk, who not only presented an idea publicly, two mainstream persons about BCIs, but also was talking about BCIs for mainstream users. You know, it's Facebook 
was talking about a non-invasive system that could work with, with anybody, not just with patients. And they presented a lot of applications. And our problem with this, and I've talked to a lot of BCI people, is we don't really have any information from Facebook, and so it's very difficult for us to comment. They gave a talk at the 2018 BCI meeting, and similar to some videos and things, they talked about optical imaging, but we don't really know what they're doing. And to be fair, they're a company, they're a for-profit entity, they're not necessarily required to tell us. I just really wish that they would, or at least tell me. Yes. Well, this is Neuralink. That's here. So this is a new effort popularized by Elon Musk, and there you see talk about Neuralink and Neuralace, and this is a similar case where you have someone who's very well established, very well known to mainstream people who, who's talking about this. In the case of Neuralink, they seem to be focused on invasive approaches. So specifically, they have this idea that something would be implanted just behind the ear or somewhere. And so that's kind of a different direction. But still, these are quite futuristic ideas. I mean, they're not imminent. And I'll talk about this over the next few slides. Uh, the, the field does need a breakthrough. We, we could benefit from the, the scale of research that, that this is. Are people like me able to come up with the sorts of developments that companies could, spending millions of dollars over the course of several years? Certainly not. I'm familiar with a lot of the BCI labs, their grants, <laughs> exactly how much money is involved. And of course, uh, the scale matters. Another example is Galvani Bioelectrics, which not as many, they haven't been as public, but they're a company that was started by, I believe, GlaxoSmithKline and Verily. So these are two big companies. I believe it was a $780 million start, starting company, so it was quite big. And they're talking about electronic biomedicine, which seems to be kind of like the term adaptive neurotechnology from Walpaw and colleagues, where they're talking about devices that both read and write not only to the brain, but the nervous system. For example, the spinal cord to help persons with spinal cord injuries. So although that's sort of broader than what most people think of as BCIs, it, it's still related. Sure. Online audience again. Are there any efforts that you know of in professional sports? Yes. Um, first, my colleague Christoph Guger, uh, G-U-G-E-R, he has some publications involving sports, high, athletic, high altitude athletics. So, for example, he studied people while they did a simulated ascent from 3,000 to 5,000 meters. Uh, advanced brain monitoring, I think the author was Chris Berka, B-E-R-K-A. They had some work also involving sports optimization, and it was similar to work they did with the U.S. Marine Corps. They had a study where they were studying people as they learned how to fire rifles to try to help them be more accurate. And similarly, they were working on trying to help acquisition of sports knowledge. And I know there are some other examples, I just don't know them right now. But yeah, people have talked about it. And this is another example of something where you might have more eager early adopters. If I were to use a BCI to become better at tennis or something, well, nobody cares. If you're an Olympic athlete, even the tiniest improvement could, could matter and could be worth a tremendous amount of money. Uh, sports, another, another sports example, although it's a different application. GE and Siemens had a grant call several years ago for new concussion detection systems. So that's an, an, another application with sport. If you're wearing a, a helmet, and you can have an EEG system that can help determine things like concussion, that's quite helpful. And of course, I would say, again, it should be a hybrid system. The first thing I would say is have an accelerometer in the helmet, have something that measures neck flexion. But given all those things, is it possible that EEG would provide additional information, not so much on the injury itself, but how it affected the brain? Well, yes, that, I think that's a reasonable direction. So that is an application with sport. And if it makes people safer, well, great. Not, not boxing, also not getting punched in the face. So I'm not a medical doctor, but I am a brain scientist. Try not to get punched in the face. But. So yeah, with these, uh, 
it's hard for me to make a, a comment without knowing more about them, comment about exactly their technology. But I, I will have a few slides where I'm talking about applications. And so these are some of the questions that I think need to be asked critically, not just of them, but of, of other ones. So one thing that's not clear is what is the training time? Great, you have a BCI that is 100 words per minute. That would be an extraordinary breakthrough. I'd say 10 words per minute. I'd call that pretty good. How long does it take to train the user? How long does it take to train the system? Literacy, does this work on 90% of people who try it? Is it... Is it just one person who works in Facebook? Out of all the employees, you screened them all and you found the very best, or is it something more universal? Error rates and error corrections. So you might show a video where someone spells perfectly. Is that representative of normal operation? An error correction. If, if an error is made, what happens? That's an issue. Another big one is word or sentence completion. So. Is it a 100 word per minute BCI in which you're actually thinking each individual word or is it something where it's inferring or assuming some parts of the word based on part of the sentence, which is a, a common thing? I'm not saying these are, are bad, I'm just saying these are examples of details that I would need and I think most BCI people would need to be able to really evaluate is this a breakthrough or what's happening? And I mentioned number of users or takes, you know, again, does it work on everyone? I do object to this, so none of these entities are really engaging the BCI community much. This is not just my view, it comes up all the time. And this raises another question of how does this affect public perception of BCIs? And so I'll get to these slides. Um, but here's an example of where this gets worrisome. And I'm not citing any of these companies, but this is a specific example from a paper. So a lot of articles from me and from others have raised concerns about regulation or at least accurate information about direct-to-consumer brain devices. This is an example that was quoted in this article. Because the Sleep Shepherd lets you directly control your brain rate, you can naturally build a better, healthier sleep cycle that allows you to fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and have more energy during the day. By the way, these comments are not endorsed by the FDA. Well, a few things. First, if you know what it means to control your brain rate, please let me know. I'm a professional neuroscientist. I have no idea. I've asked other neuroscientists. They're like, we don't know. Maybe it means control brain frequencies like alpha or beta, but does that mean you have more activity at a certain frequency? Are you training for a different peak frequency? Are you training the ratio? But moreover, if if this were true, wonderful. I mean, everybody would do it. It might be true. I don't know. But this is an example of something where you could imagine that someone who bought this and then found that their sleep didn't improve would then be a lot more skeptical, not only about BCIs in general, but people like me. So I've said this before. It, it, a friend of mine from Microsoft, it resonated with me. You know, I go and people say, oh, BCIs are, are stupid. They're not useful for mainstream people. Or they're unethical. They're potentially dangerous. They don't work. And I, I can understand why many people would think that, given what's out there. And so, in 2018, to talk more about this mainstream BCI or big BCI, this is a list of the sponsors of the 2018 BCI meeting. So this was the main conference for BCIs in 2018. None of these are big companies, <laughs> with, with respect to them. None of them are like Elon Musk or Facebook. I know most of these guys, of course, we appreciate the sponsorship, but this is, it's kind of like the beginning of my talk where I sort of liked having it frozen in time. As of 2020, this is the involvement of BCI. This is the perception of BCIs. As of 2018, these are the biggest companies that are sponsoring the biggest conference. Another issue from, I call, science fiction about BCIs, it's bi-fi, it's not sci-fi. And another common view that we have to address that comes from this is that basically BCI is, is evil, right? A BCI is made by evil people to be used for evil purposes. A major exception, the first Star Trek pilot, this is a very realistic and altruistic portrayal of BCIs. Captain Pike is a disabled person. He was a military hero. He saved many cadets from Delta radiation. They describe in detail how this works. He can 
do one thing for yes or two for no, he can move around. That's about right. That's about consistent with the wheelchair level control we have for a lot of people. But all of these other ones are examples where the BCI is used to, to oppress, to spy on people, to, to cause harm in some way. And the worst one is, of course, more than 50% of Black Mirror episodes have BCIs. I refer to this as the Brooker BCI because it's a guy named Charlie Brooker. It's usually the same. It's a tiny thing that you just stick right there on the temple. And there appears to be no limitation of its capability. It has complete read-write capability, totally immersive. And with arguably one exception, it, they're evil. I mean, they're being used to in, in really, really iffy ways. I say this not theoretically. I've run into people, you know, and you mention what you do, and they have a very bad reaction to it. And when you talk to them, it's because of things like this. They believe this is what BCIs are. The bigger problem is that it messes up public discussion of ethics. That is, these are, are, these are more pragmatic and realistic ethical things. We do have ethical discussion boards. If anyone's at the BCI meeting, I'm, I'm leading a workshop where we're trying to work on ethical guidelines for companies and mainstream applications. Any of you would be most welcome. And you know, there are good sides of it. Uh, big BCI in particular could reduce system cost. This is huge. It's just like a car. If you start manufacturing EEG systems on the scale of tens of thousands or millions, it becomes far, far cheaper. It could foster new applications, including patient applications. And this came up a lot during lunch that I think even if a company is purely focused on mainstream users, has no interest in patients whatsoever, indirectly that will lead to patient benefit, partly through reduced system costs, partly through new application, partly also through improved integration, so it might be easier for a disabled person to use Microsoft. Raise public awareness, that's good. Inspire more funding, that's good. And, I mentioned this before, lead to a breakthrough. Large-scale research has never really been done before with BCI. But there are some problems. Could encourage false claims and hype. Draw attention away from patient applications. Could lead to public mistrust or fear. Less funding. And so this gets to the issue of managing expectations, which is relevant to mainstream users. What if it doesn't work? What if a system causes harm, even if it's not a real BCI? The, the media interprets it as such. Someone misreads the article. You know, so there's been some work toward real-time brain stimulation systems. You know, that, and this is one example that I saw at a conference, a company called Focus, where they were presenting this as a system for gamers to maintain vigilance. It's a brain stimulation tool, so it directly influences the brain. I said, these gamers that stay up already for 72 hours drinking Mountain Dew don't need a system to make them stay up longer. This, it's called No More Woof. This is, you can look it up. And it claims to be a BCI that can determine your dog's mental state. And I think it says, it can find uh, 13 different mental states or something. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's better than I can do with people. And this one, what if the BCI system or the practitioner hasn't been represented accurately? You know, due, due diligence is an issue. That's a story I can tell, tell later. What if the BCI person is not trained in ethics or working with people? So a lot of us, when we're working with patients, we're trained on issues, and there are things like ethical training, getting approved by a local IRB. Many companies don't, don't have that, which may be relevant. This is a story where I was talking about this topic at the BCI meeting in 2010, and Niels Bierbaumer stood up, and he said, in 1975, I was doing neurofeedback research. I was a known and respected expert in the field, and neurofeedback was hot, it was popular. And by 1979, the field had become so saturated with bad companies and bad claims, I no longer said that. I would send out grant proposals doing the same thing, but I would never use the word neurofeedback because it became a bad word. And is it possible this is where BCI is going, where 
I've already talked to people, Torsten Zander is one, where they've talked about using alternate terms just because a lot of people are saying, oh, BCI is a bunch of uh, hooey or whatever you want. Popular BCI article, sensationalize. So this was an article from Salon, and it was referring to a non-invasive, it was a, a BCI that would just detect activity. Now, it's true. Technically, this is thought control. That is, you are using your thoughts to control something else. But I think most people who see this and are familiar with Pink Floyd would instead interpret this very differently. They're referring to controlling the user's thought rather than the user controlling something else with the attendant implications of nasty government and, and so on. And I haven't talked very much about implanted BCIs or invasive BCIs because, of course, right now the view is that these are only appropriate for patients who really need them. But I, I can see this changing. So cosmetic or dental surgery used to be taboo. There was a time when you would say, you want surgery to change the shape of your nose? You want surgery to change? No, that's ridiculous. You don't need it. It's not a medical need. And yet a lot of people have said this has a huge impact. They didn't feel comfortable going out in public. It changed their social life. People have talked about minimally invasive neurosurgery, which is still neurosurgery. So this is, you know, there's a lot of this, can you drill a hole through the head? Uh, 10,000 come in? Yeah, or 10,000, <laughs> that would be the Elon Musk answer, right. So this was a great one at what the, one of the BCI meetings. So I didn't bring it up, but someone was talking about minimally invasive neurosurgery, and a guy named Eric Luthart stood up, and he said, I'm a neurosurgeon. And... We knew him. He really is a neurosurgeon. And he said, All of, it's still neurosurgery. If you're drilling a hole in the head, if you're putting something in the brain, it's not something a regular medical doctor can do. It's not something a surgeon can do. You need to be a neurosurgeon. But the other thing he said is that relative to most neurosurgeries, the risk and the time involved is relatively low. He said, I, I've put direct DBS stimulators deep in patients' brains where you've got to go through lots of brain tissue. And so he said that, yes, it's still neurosurgery, but it doesn't have the same level of risk as, as other neurosurgeries. And the reason I mention this is when you're considering the cost-benefit trade-off of, of that. So would I recommend an implanted BCI purely for casual means? No, not right now but that might change. This I won't go over in great detail because I only have a few minutes left. And, um, you know, but this, these are more the ethical issues that we discuss in the BCI community, things like auton autonomy, identif identity, agency, things like that. And of course, healthy users are a little different than patients. They can give informed consent, unlike many people I've worked with who are diagnosed as comatose. There's no way you can get their consent ahead of time. There might be a lower risk of, of harm, maybe not. They may have more options to, to call you on something. If they have a complaint, they have a problem. Perhaps with healthy users, medical investigations are less likely. I say perhaps. And in the 2002 BCI conference, there was the notorious forget the patients approach where People were saying, what if instead of focusing on patients, we just focus on healthy users because that will ultimately create the most benefit to patients. Patients are a tiny group. Nobody's doing anything with them. The money is in big BCI. Let's do that, and that's what will ultimately help the patients. That was a huge controversy there along with this issue. I mean, it was a big, everyone was talking about it. Uh, anyway, getting toward the end. Does the cost benefit change with public users? And so I'm saying, yes, certainly. One of the reasons why BCI has been so focused on severely disabled people is not just ethical and practical reasons, but if you're working in academia, that, that's where the funding is. You have a grant proposal and you say, we're going to do something to help people with ALS. The NIH would be interested in that. And you say, we're going to do something to make a lot of money. That's not really fundable, at least through those grant mechanisms. And if you go for an SBIR or something, they're not interested in public benefit. They're interested in profitability. Transhumanism has even this idea of future disability, which is that we're all disabled right now because in 50 years, we're going to all have super abilities. And relative to those future people, we're stupid, slow. <laughs> so here are some options. The last couple slides are just some things about 
ways to help address this problem, which are relevant to Microsoft or anybody, anybody that might be interested in paving the way for mainstream BCIs. You know, and talk and give talks. I'm doing that right now, talking to various entities, complaining during lectures like these. I'm doing that right now. I mentioned I would plug the BCI Society. So this is a nonprofit organization to encourage ethical, good use of BCI. If you want more public funding, you guys are private, so I'm not bugging you for that. And here's some things that are also changing. So first, you see a lot of improvement in sort of BCI training and infrastructure. So another way to look at BCI as going mainstream or even going toward more users is not just the end users, but the developers. How, how are students or developers even going to think about BCIs in the first place? So for example, this entity, National Center for Adaptive Neurotechnology, has summer schools. And more people are teaching classes that are either explicitly focused on BCIs or at least mention them. That's a huge deal. You're an engineering student. How are you going to learn about this? There's a lot of stuff online. So those of you watching at home, if you'd like to learn about BCIs, you can do a search. Uh, BCI 2000, OpenVibe, OpenBCI. There are really a lot of examples you can find online, not just of, of training videos, but software so that you can, can work on BCIs. There has been a growth in official entities. So every two years, we have this BCI meeting I told you about. Every odd-numbered year, there is a BCI conference in Graz which is a, a top institute for BCI activity. There is now a BCI journal that's been around for a few years, Special Issues and Frontiers. And I've had some contribution to trying to get BCIs in museums and public hackathons. There are all these public BCI hackathons that are fun. I wanted to plug our upcoming conference, which is near Waterloo. And finally, I'd like to thank both Hannes and Yvonne for inviting me to speak here. And here's my email if you have any questions. Thank you. So you spoke mostly about getting some information from the brain mm -hmm. and controlling something. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about human-computer interfaces, they are bidirectional. How much work has been done? And I deeply understand the ethical concerns here mm -hmm. on the opposite direction. A lot. So one example, I mentioned the control of cockroaches. I also mentioned control of rats. These are both in that direction. So this was a, this used to be some of my intro slides. And the problem is that understandably, everybody wanted to argue about what BCIs are, which is true. So to answer your question, first, the term BCI, the acronym is terrible. Terrible choice of acronym. In the literature, it's defined as a device for sending information from the brain to a computer. But there's no reason you would believe that from the acronym. Also, it's defined as something direct. But Edwin Hutchins, who is a professor in the Cognitive Science Department, he says a, a keyboard is an interface between a brain and a computer. A monitor is. So I agree. I've railed against it in papers, but with no luck. So. The term BCI, again, is defined in the literature and not defined by the acronym because it's not a clear acronym. It's defined as something that only reads from the brain. Then the European Commission came up with this BNCI, by which they mean reads from the brain or the peripheral nervous system. Then this broader term, adaptive neurotechnology, means something that can read and write to either system. I would be very happy to work with you to come up with some new terminology or taxonomy. I, I really don't like this. It's not obvious. And every time I give a talk, like I said, I've given up uh, having this. Similarly, I was going to start my slide with this. Walpaw and Walpaw, or my talk with this, the Walpaw and Walpaw model, replace, improve, supplement, enhance, restore. He was presenting it from the five different perspectives of how you could use a BCI. But then, again, people say, well, that's good, but what about writing to the brain? And uh, that this just. This is in the Wikipedia, by the way. Yeah, right. This is all over. This was his 2012 book. You know, and so then you can break it down this way. So, for example, prior work on replacing, using a BCI to replace a lost function, 
That's been very extensively explored. You know, so this is a big, a big issue with patients. You've lost the ability to spell, so we give you a wholly new way to spell. For the general population, that's not applicable. It's designed to replace a lost function. You've lost nothing. Or to restore. So the idea here is that you're not replacing a lost function, but you're, you're taking something that they've lost the ability to do, like move their hand, and restoring that ability. So the difference is here you're just it's, you're replacing. Here you're using the same system, like stroke rehab. Similar thing for the general population. By definition, they have nothing to restore. But you look at some of these other things. Can you use it to improve? By here, he meant improve something beyond your normal function. And so this is a hot topic for patients. It's promising. For the general population, it might be scary. Do you, do you really want half the population, probably the richest half, or half of 1% to have different abilities? So, so yes, you're right. And I, I cannot defend the term BCI. So, but I'm completely satisfied from this interpretation of the of what we claim to work on. Right. Incidentally, there are, I, there are a lot of examples in the literature of trying to come up with different terms. Uh, Scott McCaig, who I mentioned, used the phrase brain actuated control. Uh, Jane Huggins from the University of Michigan called it direct brain interface, which is great because it gets rid of the direct part, but there's still how is it clear that it's a brain to computer interface? Uh, <laughs> this is yet another reason why there's some talk about just moving away from the term altogether. But that would require us all to agree, and that's just not going to happen. Just yes. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine Pratt says that Facebook did publish um, mm -hmm. a paper, mm -hmm. um, and it's with ECOG. The one with Emily Mugler? It's paper? a nature paper. The authors, no. Okay. Different authors. They are from uh, U.S. San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco. Okay, I'll look into that and thank at, you. At the bottom, it says that the work was funded by Facebook. I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah, I send the link. The second question or comment was that um, there's a lot of work being done on neuroethics, mm -hmm. neuroethics guidelines from the Center for Neurotechnology here in Seattle, mm -hmm. University of Washington. And then that's some links in there. On the oh, Rao. Yeah, so I, I have very great respect for Professor Rao, Chantal Pratt, and their colleagues, and have for many years. I've visited their lab. They've been around for a long time. They got some good publicity with their brain-to-brain -brain interface. I, I would be delighted if them or their group could come to the meeting where we have a discussion on, on this issue of, of, main, of ethical and practical guideline issues. Another quick comment is that they also were, some media articles came out based on their archive presentation of some work. And so I interacted with them a bit because I was saying to those two people, this seems like it's unethical from a media perspective. You're supposed to wait for the article to get published, and they didn't, it doesn't seem to be something that you wanted. It was just a preprint, and they were saying, yeah, it was not our intent for that to be picked up by the media yet. Of course, you want it to get peer-reviewed first. So I, I sympathize with them on that, but that's also a, an issue in neuroethics that I'd like to discuss and develop guidelines you know, so one might say there's already that guideline. It's called the Inglefinger Rule. It says you're not supposed to publicize something until it's been peer-reviewed. And yet, even though that is known, it seems that a reminder or something might be necessary because it has been happening. I just saw something on CNN that I was really interested in. it. It was talking about mysterious radio signals that repeated. 16 dates. Yeah, and then as I'm reading it, it said this is based on an archive preprint, and I was looking to see if they directly interviewed the, the people involved. And so I was then wondering the same thing. Is this something that's ready to show to people like me? I'm not an astronomy expert. What if it goes through peer review and their problems arise or something? I mean, this is a this is a really common thing that I, I know a number of journalists basically just troll through archive, right, to find cool stuff, and it doesn't matter whether it's. I mean, if it's cool stuff, it's cool stuff. It's going to get good print. It's going to get a good click through. Uh, and I mean, it sucks, but I don't think there's really 
that's not really an ethical issue on the part of um, the scientists because there is a lot of benefit to having something like archive as well. You know, so right. I'm not, I'm not, I, 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 I'm uncomfortable putting that off on the scientists. Oh no, I, I don't mean to. What I was, my interaction with with them is that I had been contacted by a journalist who wanted me to comment on it, and so when I realized that, I asked Professor Rao and Professor Pratt, hey, just wanted to double check with you. It seems that they haven't worked with you yet, and I don't feel comfortable talking about this unless I'm missing something. And they wrote back and they said, said that. So that's what I said to the journalist. I said very politely, I, I can't do this. And I, I said something like, I think this would be unethical. It's a preprint and it's not meant for public dissemination. And to be fair, that journalist and that newspaper never published anything about it. So. I wish I knew, I remembered who, because I'd like to publicly thank. It was good. I'm happy to take more questions. I have a mm -hmm. question or more comment. Um, at the, towards the beginning of the talk, you said that um, the applications for healthy people um, would include cases where a healthy person is disabled within some sort of environment or setting. That's mm -hmm. when things mm -hmm. might be useful for healthy people. I guess the difference between it is an actual disabled person and a healthy person being disabled temporarily is that potentially some sort of brain connections are there versus are not, depending right. on the disability. So that would be another challenge. Right. Certainly, that in, in some cases, it's not simply an ex a case of disability by the situation, but also in any situation you might have limited capability. Uh, one common example that has come up that didn't quite seem to pan out is that there was a lot of concern with P300 and SSVEP BCIs because of the presumption that they required control of gaze. And so they thought, well, if you can move your eyes, why not just use an eye tracker? Why bother with the BCI? And there were two answers that came up. One is that first, various papers showed that P300 and SSVEP BCIs can function without gaze shifting in some cases. So even a patient with no eye control can choose to pay attention to the left or right side. But the other thing that came up was, as I mentioned, some people chose them anyway. And you might even look at it as sort of situational disability in the sense that you can use an eye tracker in one situation, which is that you're not tired. After using an eye tracker until your eyes become tired, in some way that's a little like situational disability. Now, all of a sudden, you can't use an eye tracker anymore, and so at least temporarily. You know, so this is what that paper I mentioned from Robert Lieb and Jose Mian and colleagues was getting at, was the prospect that people might switch between a BCI and another interface based on their situation, including just fatigue. So yes, to expand, I don't mean the situation meaning only that you're in a certain environment or using a certain type of interface. It, it, could, it could be various situations that would lead you to want to use a BCI when you might not otherwise in a different situation. I guess there are no more questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.